Hi everyone. My name is Eliza Abrams and I graduated from Monument in 2018 and I am now a junior at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. I know it may be hard to kind of consider your career options right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic and people are probably stressing over college applications or just wrapping up that process for some of us, but I'm hoping to renew a little bit of excitement about what your future may hold if you do have interest in a profession in the healthcare industry. So I'll just start out with giving a little bit of an overview of some career options, and then I'll focus in on six different ones that I've explored myself since I started considering my career in middle school and to where I am now in college. And then I'll go into a little more detail about my personal journey as far as like how I found opportunities for research or clinical experience, how I found mentors, or just shadowing and volunteer opportunities. And then we'll circle back to all of you and how you can kind of play to your own strengths and reflect upon your goals for what you want in educational experience or in a future career and how to utilize the resources around you to prepare yourself for success in a future career. Um, so obviously we all know there are a bunch of health and wellness related occupations and there's, this is a non-exhaustive list, but there's still a bunch on here. I'll take, I'll give you all a second to just look at it for a moment in case there's anything that you might not even have considered, like a genetic counselor, um, an athletic trainer, biomedical engineering, psychiatry, all of those options. And then on the bottom right, we have the ones that I'm gonna touch upon. We have the pair under physicians and then registered nurses versus nurse practitioners, and then physical therapy and occupational therapy. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with nursing, then I'll go into medicine and then rehabilitative care. And I don't wanna bog everyone down too much into the details, but I'm just gonna to touch, on the, touch on them a little bit before we get onto the next portion of the presentation. So registered nurses are usually qualified via an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, but in the coming years, it's likely that it'll be mainly bachelor's degrees because people are going back to school even when they're already RNs with associate's degrees and it's becoming more preferred that you have a bachelor's degree. And as the name implies, nurses operate under the nursing model, which tends to be a patient-centered care model rather than a disease-centered care model, more of a whole picture, hands-on approach. And one of the benefits of becoming registered nurse is having the possibility of switching between a bunch of different work environments. So you could become a travel nurse, a school nurse, you could be a surgical nurse, and <clears throat> you can change your location at any point. You could be in a hospital, a private practice, all of the above. There's also the benefit of a shorter time in school during undergraduate or graduate coursework, and often there's a better work-life balance with this profession. Well, thing to consider if you're um, really a fan of independence you do have to work under somebody else as a registered nurse and then in contrast to that we have a nurse practitioner who will either have a master's degree in nursing or a doctorate in nursing practice and this process will take you about two to four years after undergraduate degree obviously a nurse practitioner focuses on the same patient-centered care model versus the medical model and one thing to consider for nurse practitioners is that there isn't quite as much flexibility in terms of lateral mobility. So what I mean by that is when you go into a nurse practitioner degree program, you're going to eventually choose a specialty that you're gonna focus on like pediatrics or uh, like elderly patients, psychiatry, those sorts of things. And that will be a part of your degree. So you're gonna, focus on that in the rest of your practice during your life versus a PA, which we'll get into later in, later in the lecture. One benefit for nurse practitioners is that they do have more independence, and in some states they can work independently of an overseeing physician, for example, and have their own private practice. Then moving on to medicine, we have a physician and a physician assistant. So a physician can either acquire an MD or a DO, which is a doctorate of osteopathic medicine, or a dual degree with an added PhD onto one of those degrees. So you could get a PhD in public health as well to complement your degree if you wanted. Um, one of the benefits of this career is that there are many possible specialties. They all require differing levels of schooling, 
but you can really dig into the detail of a specialty. So you could go into orthopedic surgery, emergency medicine, pediatric medicine, so many possibilities. And this career path is gonna give you the highest level of autonomy compared to other things. So you are in charge of yourself and you would be overseeing people beneath you in the medical field. Um, but it does require a hefty amount of investment <laughs> on the front end. And there's a lot of rigorous undergraduate work then four years of graduate coursework, and then your residency program following that. Um, in complement to that, we have a physician assistant, often confused with LPNs or CNAs or nurse practitioners, but PAs require a master's degree, which is usually a two to three year program following your bachelor's degree. And one thing to consider when um, considering PA school is that you have to do a lot of clinical experience as, for example, a, an EMT, a phlebotomist, a nurse before applying to PA school. So like around 2,000 hours of clinical experience before you can even apply to be a physician's assistant, which is a little bit different than nurse practitioner school, which you become an RN before you become an NP. So it's not as specific in the clinical experience you need. Um, and in this case, you do need to be overseen by a physician in all states, in all cases. and this follows the medical model, which is more disease-centered. If that's something that's more of interest to you than the patient care-centered model. One good thing is that PAs often have a really great work-life balance. Their schooling is much less long and rigorous than the physician option. And in contrast to what I said about a nurse practitioner, there is lateral, mobi lateral mobility in this career. So if I went to PA school and I was initially interested in uh, the, R, the ER or maybe um, pediatrics, but I wasn't sure that'd be okay because I get out of PA school, maybe I spend time learning how to be an ER physician assistant, and then I'm like, this is too much for me. I'm not into being um, like in an intense situation all the time and dealing with a variety of cases, and I want a little more regularity in my life, so I'm going to go into family medicine physician assistants, and that's okay. I don't have to go back to PA school to switch locations like that. And the same thing with um, the other careers, you can explore a bunch of different work environments as a PA, inpatient, outpa outpatient, private practice, hospital setting, all those. So then moving on to my last category, we have rehabilitative care. Under these, we have PT and OT. I considered physical therapy, and then I just have two close friends who considered occupational therapy. So I Put that in here as well. Um, as far as degrees, you do need to attend an undergraduate bachelor's program before attending PT school as well as OT school. PT school is going to require an, a doctorate degree three to four years after your bachelor's. And physical therapists, similar to PAs, NPs, and nurses, tend to have a good work life balance, but they do have the added benefit of independence, ability to open their private practice, and it's much less of a on-call, potentially fast-paced job than maybe a physician or an ER nurse or something like that is, that is constantly changing throughout your workday. This is more of a consistent job. That could be a benefit for you. That could be something that might bore you later in life. I'll get to that later when I talk about my own considerations. Um, and then again, as I said, for some other jobs, variety of work environment possibilities. So you could be working with a college sports team. You could be working with elderly patients who just got out of surgery and are just like trying to get out of bed for the first time or even just learning how to breathe properly directly out of surgery. And then occupational therapy is very interconnected with physical therapy, but I usually think of day-to-day -day tasks and younger populations and people, people with different abilities in this kind of career path. Similar situation with the degrees though, two to three years after undergraduate. So it's slightly shorter than the PT track and you can get a master's rather than a doctorate degree in this case. But I'm guessing that as we go down the line, eventually a doctorate degree will be favored over a master's degree and it may become only a doctorate degree career. And yet again, good work-life balance and the ability to have independence and switch job locations frequently. 
And I know several occupational therapists who aren't necessarily working in the same location every day, like a set office, you could be going into a school setting and then into a hospital setting. You can create whatever sense of spontaneity or consistency that you would like. And as I mentioned earlier, this occupation does have a great ability to work with diverse populations. So now that we've kind of gone over a very quick <laughs> overview of some of the popular health professions, I know that might be a little bit, and some people here may have researched a bunch of health professions and they know all of that, and some people might just be starting to peek into healthcare. So hopefully that gave a little bit of a general overview. But as far as my personal journey, <laughs> I began in middle school. I was like, I'm gonna become a physician assistant because I don't want the responsibility of being a doctor and I can't imagine being in school for so long because I'm already of high school and college ahead of me. There's no way. And in middle school, I was like, I don't want debt. And <laughs> I've since changed my path many times. So after considering physician assistant school, I was turned off by the idea of having to do a bunch of clinical hours before going to grad school. And I was a little overwhelmed by it. I wasn't sure if I really wanted to be in a career that was focused more in the disease and I was interested in maybe considering the whole picture of the patient and following the nursing model. So that kind of led me to the cousin of physician assistant nurse practitioner and I was kind of set on that for three years in high school and I was like I'm going to become a certified nurse midwife which is a specialty within uh, nursing practice and then after that I was like maybe I don't know what I'm doing considered nursing and I was thinking maybe I just become a nurse see how that feels, and then consider a further degree, a PhD, or a doctorate after that. Um, that was in the beginning of college. And my, my health advisor was like, sure, great option. She's a physical therapist. And then I spent a year under her advising and doing research with her. And I was like, oh, maybe I should be like her because she's super cool. And she does physical therapy for dancers. So I started considering that. And I finally got over my fear of having to take physics in order to go to grad school to be a physical therapist and um, pursued that interest in like the past year maybe. Um, and then this summer I ended up finally being like, you know what, I'm going to take orgo and all of the prerequisites for medical school. And I told my advisor, how do you, what do you think of me becoming a doctor instead after considering every other possibility? And she was like, you know, I knew you were going to end up at this spot but I just was gonna let you get there <laughs> yourself. So now <laughs> I'm working on my clinical experience for medical school as an EMT, and I've been doing research to work on it as well. And I'm finally settled on that career path and I st think I'll stick with it, but I'm sure I'll have a lot of zigzags on my journey as I try to figure out a specialty and go through the process of applying to medical school. But just to go backtrack a little bit on my personal journey, and bring it back into perspective in terms of high school students and potential monument students that are watching today. Um, one of the great ways to kind of dip your toes into healthcare is shadowing. So I talked to Mr. Flynn my senior year of high school and I said, you know, I'm considering a career in healthcare. I have no idea what position I want, but how can I find a place to gain more experience in the Berkshires? So he set me up with the Fairview Hospital shadowing program that was a wonderful way to have consistent shadowing experience. It's obviously probably not a possibility right now, but in the coming years, I'm hoping it will be. I had a set day, Thursday afternoons, I spent four hours there. I was on the labor and delivery floor working with one of the nurses. And honestly, the Fairview labor and delivery floor is pretty small. So I, I thought I was gonna be seeing a bunch of births every day, <laughs> but I wasn't. There was usually only two patients on the floor every day. So, you know, set your expectations neutrally for when you go into shadowing experiences. But I ended up learning a lot just from talking to the nurses about how they got their degrees, why they chose nursing over other careers. And they had me like look at some of uh, their case files and work through different problems with me. Um, and I also did speak to some of the doctors as they came for rotations during the days. Um, and then I, after labor and delivery, I went to medical surgical floor and the ER for a little bit as well, but then we hit winter break and I was not able to continue shadowing. But that's a great option for people in the future once that's a possibility again. 
And then once I, after that, I knew I definitely wanted to be in healthcare. So at Skid, when I was looking at colleges, Skidmore had uh, an emergency medical uh, services club, or I don't know if club is the right name for it, but we have an EMP squad on campus that takes care of um, minor medical emergencies that happen on campus and we work close, closely with our campus safety crew. So I was able to be trained in a class on Sunday mornings at the crack of dawn <laughs> to be an EMT and that's now how I'm kind of gaining my medical experience for medical school. I think this is also just a great option for high schoolers or college students because I believe, I don't know if it's 16, 17, I think it's 18 year olds are eligible to become EMTs. Not totally sure on that one, but um, this way you can see a variety of cases, you're on the go once you're on a call and you're in contact with often a lot of veteran paramedics and EMTs who have a lot of experience to share with you. I've noticed that many of them will direct you to pursuing nursing or medicine instead of uh, being a EMT or a paramedic, but it's a great way to talk to people, network, and get hands-on experience for sure. And then I also knew that I wanted to explore the idea of research later in life, and I didn't know if maybe I didn't want to deal with patients, so I made sure to try to get involved with undergraduate research. One thing that can, you want to consider when looking at universities or colleges, if that's something in your future, is accessibility to research. So when I was applying to colleges, I asked them, like, how many freshmen and sophomores are able to do research with professors? If you're at a big university, that may not be a possibility, and you may have to be a junior or senior to get involved, but it may, it may well be, I don't know. I'm at a small liberal arts college, so it's super accessible for freshmen and sophomores to get involved in research, and you just have to put yourself out there. You send a bunch of emails, you ask your advisors, and usually an option will come up for you. You just have to be a little bit patient. Freshman year, I just volunteered with somebody working on their thesis, and she was studying um, how balanced training in uh, ballet classes for people over the age of 50 affected their uh, balance. <laughs> and the results were actually super disappointing and ballet classes did not help the elderly inv individuals with their balance at all. <laughs> but we're continuing to research that and that may be part of my thesis down the line. And then I also joined my uh, health professions advisor in her research on cardiovascular disease in firefighters. That's what I worked on all summer. It's a very niche topic, but it's also super relevant. And we have a very close-knit research team. And I've been able to kind of work on my writing skills, which is a super important skill to have in healthcare professions, especially in terms of applying and just being an effective, applying to graduate school and being an effective communicator. So that's that on research, always a great option. And maybe you will find out that research is more suited for you and you wanna just deal with the data or the subjects and not actually be in a clinical setting. And then as far as my pre-med path, obviously I'm a little, I was a little late to get to the game in terms of medicine, but there are a lot of prerequisite classes for pre-med and you just have to be realistic with yourself about how you're gonna tackle them, time management, and try to think of what your end goal is and the fact that it's going to pay off in five to ten years from now and try to find for example the equivalent of uh monument alumni tutors is our peer academic coaching resource so i definitely wouldn't have gotten through chemistry if i didn't rely on going to sunday night tutoring every weekend i have no shame in that so you got to find your resources in your professor's office hours maybe your classmates are really good study group people or maybe you don't do group studying and that's distracting. You gotta find whatever's gonna work for you. And then I just encourage everyone to volunteer or do any sort of extracurricular activity that is whatever they're interested in. It does not need to be health related in any way for you to be an acceptable candidate for something after undergraduate school or after high school. Just as long as you show that you're interested in it and passionate about it and you show consistency, that's okay. Don't spread yourself thin and just join a bunch of clubs that you think might look good or volunteer for some organization that seems great but you actually think is the most boring thing ever. Just find a few things and stick to them and put yourself out there. So taking this off of my journey, let me just give, a, I'm gonna go over a few things that I think might be helpful to try to not be too overwhelming when you're considering some of the health professions. Um, 
So I encourage you to just reflect upon what exactly it is that interests you in healthcare careers and maybe consider some of your strengths or your weaknesses if you can't deal with blood. If you can deal with blood, are you interested in um, being one-on-one -on -one with a patient and actually having those conversations or do you wanna be more like hands-off? Do you wanna have a team that you're working with? Do you wanna be overseeing the team? Do you want to be able to spend time in your life on other hobbies outside of work? Do you wanna be on call? Would you like to have a consistent schedule? Do you wanna be seeing the same kind of cases every day? All those sorts of things are good to consider. And I guess as you're watching tonight, maybe consider those things afterwards, jot down a few thoughts about what exactly is pushing you towards pursuing a career in healthcare or a specific career in healthcare. Oh, and then, yeah, no, we're good. Autonomy is a good one. Um, oh, of course, finances too, because all these careers require different levels of schooling and you have to be realistic about what you're willing to pay in order to get your degree and how you're gonna manage to recover from that or, and all, all those, be, just be realistic about what you would like um, to deal with in terms of the financial burden. Um, let's see, okay, yeah, so taking initiative in terms of gaining volunteering, shadowing, and clinical experiences. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but you just gotta put yourself out there and realize that most of the time the people around you, especially people who are older than you or your mentors and professors, they're gonna be super willing to help you and very willing to um, give you advice about how to succeed or find new experiences. So obviously right now it's difficult to gain shadowing and clinical experience with the pandemic. And I've been getting a bunch of emails back about my shadowing experiences for this winter, about them being canceled or about them being postponed. But one thing I found was you just have to be creative. I was on TikTok, I found Web Shadowers, which is an organization where they do YouTube live calls every week, three times a week, I think with a bunch of young physicians in different specialties. And they'll give you case studies, they'll give an overview of your career, of their career and their day-to-day -day life. You take a little survey at the end to prove that you attended the call. And then like every few months, the organization web shadowers will like tally up the hours different students have attended in order to give you a certificate. So if you end, attend like 20 plus hours or something, you'll get a certificate for shadowing with that organization. Obviously I haven't seen People get into medical school after doing web shadowers, but it is an accredited organization that is organized by current pre-medical students. So be creative during these times in terms of finding shadowing clinical experiences. And maybe it's just watching like some doctors you might know through a family member give talks online for now. Like everything is within context right now. Everyone is going through the same pandemic pandemic so don't be discouraged and everyone is being slowed down at the same rate that you are and in terms of volunteer experience just reiterating volunteer in whatever you're interested in it can be in whatever a children's daycare volunteering in a garden in a um let's see best buddies organization i'm in the skidmore democrats club that's not that's a lot of volunteering for just voter registration it doesn't need to be specific to your future career. And then as far as undergraduate possibilities, if you are considering college for whatever health, healthcare career you're going into, I would just suggest thinking about what the network, asking if you're visiting, what the network is like that will support you as you explore these options. So do they have a pre-health advising committee? Do you have an advisor that is specific to healthcare professions outside of your normal advisor? Are there pre-health clubs? research opportunities, clinical opportunities, like is there a flu clinic where students volunteer each semester? Just those sorts of details are always good to ask. And then maybe ask them about their acceptance rates into graduate schools. See if students who attend this school are actually able to get through the prerequisites for graduate schools and successfully be admitted to them. Um, and then distinguishing yourself on papers and in interviews. So again, I've talked about taking initiative and kind of becoming well-rounded in your interests. And again, if you're in an interview or you have your resume, there's going to be transparency. You're gonna be more transparent than you think about like your motivations 
So you can't just come up with like a last minute why answer, answer to the why medicine question before medical school interview. As you go through this process, try to kind of document your motivations. Like, am I interested in this because I'm interested in science? Do I want to help people? Those are classic answers. Or um, let's see, interested in science, interested in helping people. What's the other one that's classic? I don't know. But that's not going to, that answer is not going to fly. Everyone's going to have that answer. You need to get a little more nuanced than that because if you want to help people, why aren't you being a teacher? Why aren't you being a lawyer? All those things. So that can be the first part of your answer, but you need to get a little bit further than that and add elements to your story that are demonstrated through your activities, your volunteering, your clinical experience, things that are evident on paper and that are clearly expressed in your interview and in the way you speak about your interests. People are gonna be able to tell if you're telling them the truth or not about why you're interested in a career or a graduate school. And you can seek guidance, obviously, through this program on how to put together a resume or like a clear image of yourself and how to like flesh out your volunteering and academic experiences or how to portray yourself in a good way. Um, and I'm sure many colleges will have career advising centers and all those sorts of things to help you in clarifying your goals. But I think that's it for now. Yeah, let's see. So I can take any questions um, via email. So if anyone has questions about ways to get involved within Great Barrington or the surrounding Berkshire areas for volunteer opportunities, um, online shadowing opportunities during COVID, I have a couple different ones, I just can't remember all of them right now. Um, ways to, uh, to work on building your resume if you're struggling with like putting yourself out there in terms of clubs and volunteering. All of the above. Happy to take questions anytime. I think that's it for now. Thank you. So my name is Teddy Michaels. Uh, I am a senior at Columbia College uh, studying biology and anthropology. Uh, I plan to study medicine and anthropology at a graduate level after college. Uh, I volunteered as an EMT, like Eliza. Um, I worked in a neurodevelopment lab for three years in college. Uh, otherwise, I wrote a column on uh, mindfulness in the school newspaper, and um, I taught synthetic biology to high schoolers. So um, other interests include mycology, uh, which is like the study of mushrooms, uh, and philosophy, things like social criticism and whatnot. So um, to begin, I will be presenting on the social determinants of public health and medical anthropology. The general question that these fields will deal with is this. When we come into this world, our health is on a certain path. We have control over some aspects of this path and not others. But how are these paths created for us? And how are they created unequally? To give a little background on my interest, um, I first became interested in this field while working as an EMT. Um, for those who don't know, an EMT is a medical er, emergency medical technician, and we're the ones who um, drive the sick and injured to the hospital. Um, so at Columbia, um, serving mostly Columbia students, but some faculty and people in the, in the surrounding area, um, it became so clear so fast how different the experiences of students could be even at the same school. Many issues on campus affect students disproportionately. Um, sexual assault, for example, is an epidemic throughout nearly all college campuses to which women are victims far more often than men. So going on these types of calls as an EMT, you treat individuals and that's your job, taking people to the hospital, but it's impossible to not take notice of what problems affect some people and not others. Um, and how healthcare professionals interact with different people in different ways. Um, so as a lecture on the social determinants of public health. Um, we have to define public health first. So public health is like, is the health of the public in general. And this includes things like sanitation, hygiene, um, health inspectors for restaurants, uh, otherwise like public policy, people writing laws. Um, vaccines are in a major health, um, public health improvement. Um, otherwise like clean food, clean water, clean air, 
um, tobacco and drug use, um, infectious disease. We're in a public health crisis right now in the pandemic. Um, otherwise, housing uh, and access to health care. Who has health insurance? Who's able to get the medication? This is an economic problem, too. Um, and something like seatbelts, too. You know, those are a, uh, a public health innov innovation. So comparing like this field of public health to what Eliza was working in, um, doctors work with individuals. They work one-on-one. -on -one. Public health looks at populations. And so the functional unit for a doctor is an individual. The functional unit of study for a public health uh, professional is a population. OK, so moving on. Um, public health is determined by our physical and our social environment. Um, and what I mean by social here includes things like socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, um, our social circles, and how social we are in general, how many people we see. And so um, you might have heard of that first factor, um, socioeconomic status. Um, I'll see if, I'll just go for it. Um, socioeconomic status means um, uh, education, income, and social status, these, these three things. Um, education, income, and social status. So now these three things are um, pretty interrelated. For example, if you're well-educated, you're more likely to make money, but it's only a, a general correlation. Um, and also these factors are relatively hard to define. Um, you can clearly measure education um, by how many years you were in school. Um, but when it comes to something like income, it doesn't matter how often you're paid or whether in your pay, benefits are included, whether you have a larger paycheck or you know, a pay plus health care. Um, when it comes to something like social status, it's even harder to say. So if we're looking at um, socioeconomic status as a determinant of health, um, you know, we can start with the easiest thing to define, which is education. And the classic statistic here is this. Children of high school dropouts are six times more likely than children of college graduates to be in poor health. And so we can tie this back to our initial question, how are paths of health created for us and how are they created unequally? Um, well, this high school dropout versus college graduate statistic is pretty clear and super unfair. It's a correlation based on education. But poor health can be complicated because it's a gradient. Likelihood does not address how poor the health really is. And as far as the path of health goes, it only captures a very general quality, bad or not bad. And so let's turn to a different metric of public health. Um, this is the average length um, of the path, namely life expectancy. Um, so I'm going to screen share just quickly. Um, here we are. So here is a map of St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and so this may be familiar to you as um, St. Paul is one of the Twin Cities. Uh, Minneapolis, the other Twin City, um, was in the news this past spring because that is where George Floyd was killed. Um, this is about 30 minutes from there, this uh, screenshot of St. Paul, Missouri, uh, Minnesota. And so like, well, something like segregation is um, illegal. Practically, it is very, um, you know, it, it is still occurring um, in the Midwest and in many places. So um, looking at this as a, a segregated area in um, the Midwest, here is St. Paul. And we can look at one county here. This is the Southern Historic Hill District. It's wealthy. Approximately 70% of the people here are college graduates and 85% are white. So accordingly, the average, health is, uh, the average life expectancy is 86 years old. If you live here, um, that is your average life expectancy. Now you walk 15 minutes north, and it's quite a different story. East Rondo, over 50% poverty rate, less than 10% are college graduates, and over 50% are black. So here, the average life expectancy is 65. You walk 15 minutes and take 21 years off of your life as far as an average life expectancy goes. So we're um, you know, familiar with our um, socioeconomic status 
um, which is education, social status, and income. And those are present here. Um, but we can move on to other determinants. Um, so this is where life ends. Actually here. This is where life ends. You know, how long you live, how long your average path is. But I'd argue that these paths are set very early on in our lives, from when we're children, really. Um, here, um, adverse childhood experiences. So between zero and 17 ages, um, these experiences can predispose someone to have certain outcomes later in life. Um, these include violence in the household or the surrounding community, abuse or neglect in the household, substance abuse, mental health problems, um, and instability due to parental separation, things like divorce, or household members being in jail and prison, having a broken household. So um, most people have at least one ACE. Only 36% of people have zero. And so I guess, as you can imagine, the more ACEs you have, the more adverse childhood experiences you have, the more predisposed you are to have certain health outcomes. And we can look at these pretty clearly. Childhood experiences versus adult alcoholism. Zero ACEs, and you have you know, a nearly a 2% chance of being, having an alcohol use disorder later in life. And work your way up to four plus ACEs, and that's a 16% chance. This is a very real thing from a young age. Um, I note that um, alcohol, alcoholic is like a dated term right now. Um, alcohol use disorder or someone with an AUD um, is more appropriate, less stigmatizing. But this is the general idea. Um, childhood experiences underlie chronic depression. Now, having four or more ACEs versus zero nearly triples your chance of having depression later in life. Okay, so here we are, not screen shared, um, and all right. So to summarize the ground we've covered thus far, we started out with the initial question, how are our paths in life created for us and how are they created unequal? We then looked at Socio, how socio, socioeconomic status influences the quality of that path. Remember the um, college graduate versus the high school dropout statistic. Um, and then we looked at the average, life ex, uh, average length of a path as it differs by neighborhood. Um, this was in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, how it differs by 21 years within a 15 minute walk. Um, so turning from a metric based on the end of life, life expectancy, we examined how those paths are set early on by ACEs. Um, I should note now that um, I've talked about some pretty grim things, um, but there's hope and uh, I wouldn't be in this field if I weren't optimistic. But uh, before we get on to prevention and medical anthropology, um, things I intend to go into specifically, um, in the final portion of this look at public health, uh, we can look at how paths of health are set for us before we're even born. So, to look at this, um, we need a quick review of genetics. And so what is a gene? A gene is um, associated with a certain trait. It is genetic information, our DNA. Um, and if you like remember Mendel's peas, right? Um, a certain gene determined whether a pea was wrinkled or round. Um, but most traits are more complicated than this. Many genes influence a certain trait. It's not like one gene to wrinkled or, brown, or round, it's like multiple genes to a certain trait. Um, and also, you know, a certain gene can be on or off or somewhere in between. It can be supercharged um, or like a little bit. Think of this as like not just round versus wrinkled, but like a super wrinkled pea. Um, and a good way to think of this is like every cell in our body has the same genetic information. Um, and the cells that make up like my nose, for example, has the same DNA as my kidney. Um, and what differs between these two are what genes are on and off. So moving from genetics to epigenetics, we can look at not just what is DNA, what genes are tied to what traits, but rather how things in the world turn on or off certain genes. And this process starts before birth. 
Um, so to exemplify this, we can look at um, the Netherlands in um, World War II, which is right over here. Okay. Here we see wrinkled and uh, wrinkled and round peas. So Dutch hunger winter. Um, this was in the winter between 1944 and 1945, I think November to May, um, during World War II, and there was a German occupation in the Netherlands. Um, so as the average like caloric, recommended caloric intake, how many calories you're supposed to have a day is right around 2000. Um, here in this time, the average intake was about 500 calories a day. So cut in a quarter. And what's bizarre about this, um, I guess it's a horrible thing, a horrible event, but it didn't just last that winter. It is actually lasting whole lifetimes for some people. And what I mean by this is that the epigenetic impacts affect um, the children who were, um, I guess, then embryos in their mother. Um, so famine exposure in the first two trimesters of pregnancy led to an 80% higher prevalence of becoming overweight as adults. These are the kids who were in, who were embryos in the mothers at that stage. Um, and so like this is leading to obesity, being overweight. Um, conversely, um, famine exposure in the last trimester of pregnancy led to a 40% lower prevalence of becoming overweight as adults. These are the kids who were um, in their mother's bellies then. Um, so you know, if you're curious reading up more on this, the specific genes were IGF2 and PIM3. Um, these were epigenetically modified. I think IGF2 was on all the way and PIM3 was off, or it may have been, um, may have been reversed. But yeah, um, moving on. This is um, just to show that like, as we've tracked our uh, course of health throughout a lifetime from its end to early on to before birth, this is all a very current issue. Uh, this is data from the CDC um, on public health in the COVID-19 pandemic. And so you can see rate ratios compared to white non-Hispanic persons, um, cases, hospitalizations, and death. If you are a Native American, you are 2.8 times more likely to have COVID than if you're white. Now we move over here. If you're Native American, you're 5.3 times as likely to die from, uh, to be hospitalized than if you're white. Um, and you know, very prevalent over here too, Hispanic and Latino people and um, Black or African American people. You know, 4.7 times light is more likely to be uh, hospitalized because of COVID. So it's very, alive and well. Um, and I guess like, you know, one thing to think about, you know, Native Americans are on reservations and whatnot. Um, and so like they may be clustered in a certain area. Well, that's actually a very good point because, you know, as I discussed earlier, um, you know, public health is, uh, includes housing. And so if people are worse off and are required to have kids living with grandparents, then the ability to quarantine is um, diminished. Um, so that, that's, I guess, a good application. So um, moving from this, from public health um, determinants, social determinants of public health to like medical anthropology, how we prevent this, um, thinking of you know, if you have epigenetic markers or if you have ACEs, um, there are preventative measures, I guess, for those and also to have a worse outcome later in life. And what I mean by this is um, you know, it's been shown that even if you have an ACE, having one positive um, adult influence in your life can ameliorate the effects, can lessen the effects of that ACE. Um, likewise, uh, like having positive social influence, um, exercise, meditation, all these things have been proven to, um, to improve health outcomes. Um, so I guess from that to like careers in this, well, I mentioned um, you know, sanitation, public policy, um, something like an epidemiologist is directly in public health. Um, but I'll talk about like my own career, um, what I hope to do, um, and my idol, or one of my idols, I guess. Um, so you know, as a medical anthropologist, I'm hoping to study, do an MD, PhD in medical anthropology later. Um, what this entails is, you know, looking at public health, but through the lens of you know, how it's experienced. 
This is working one-on-one -on -one with people and specifically you know, by anthropology that is investigating culture, how culture interacts with health, um, the experience of illness and how illness is shaped by society. Um, and so this is writing the stories of people um, and then kind of contextualizing in the larger public health lens. Uh, so one person who I admire particularly is um, a guy named Paul Farmer. And he you know, did the same thing that I hope to do, which is an MD and a PhD in medical anthropology. Um, he's actually from, I think, North Adams, maybe Adams, um, but ended up growing up in the South. Um, he you know, went to Harvard for his MD, PhD, and um, spent a lot of his time, spent most of his time throughout medical school and his PhD in Haiti. Um, and so his work there was working as an infectious disease doctor with um, people in poverty. Um, but specifically, the way he worked it was um, you know, he understood the experience of illness in the culture, which includes things like you know, we have this Western conception of medicine. You take this pill for this ailment and you get better. Well, that's you know, different across all cultures. Um, and so you know, voodoo medicine is very common in Haiti. And so you know, how do these two different medicines interact? How do you understand one culture to enable the other? How can they work together? Um, and so this kind of intersection of culture and medicine, you know, giving way to like population medicine, how we can change the culture across populations is um, the thing I'm kind of interested in. Um, but I guess bringing it back to Paul Farmer, what he did um, with his research and working one on one with people um, was founding a clinic and from that, um, you know, founding a, a nonprofit, um, which is now basically across the world. Um, curing tuberculosis and treating um, HIV AIDS. Uh, so that is uh, basically what I have. Um, if anyone has any questions right now, um, I will also uh, quickly screen share this. This is a book I highly recommend. Um, Tracy Kidder's um, Mountains Beyond Mountains, which is Paul Farmer's story. Um, and from this, um, I guess my lecture was your health in the world. One of my favorite quotes, medicine is a social science and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. And uh, Beer Chow was a, uh, a doctor and a public health professional um, in Poland, I think. So uh, you're welcome to email me any, um, any questions. Um, my email is up on the website. Um, otherwise, yeah, if anyone would like to talk out now, feel free to message in the chat. Um, I think that's it though. Um, thank you so much for coming. And um, if you're watching this recorded, thank you for watching. <laughs>